Um, Alex von Frankenberg here, he's the CEO of the HTGF, you know, that sounds very crazy. It sounds like a Chinese uh, fund, but actually it's the uh, government uh, fund of Germany for startups. Then we have Dirk Sturz here from the Börse Stuttgart, but obviously from the subsidiary BSDX. Um, then we have Patrick here from Iconic Funds. Um, they are also operating or in the area of uh, crypto assets. And finally, we have Christian Labic here from Block Size Capital, uh, who are developing um, yeah, software solutions uh, to connect with crypto exchanges, for example. Um, I think the best would be that everybody presents himself uh, quickly for one, two minutes and also presents his perspective on this topic. Uh, what about Bitcoin in general? And uh, do you think that institutional investors are now getting ready more and more? Who wants to start? Maybe, maybe Alex, you want to start quickly introducing you? Yeah, I'm Alex uh, from HGF. Um, HGF, a uh, 15 year old public private partnership for West investing uh, in seed stage uh, tech companies uh, uh, in very broad range, anything from hardware, robotics, energy, life science, anything around software. And uh, we did our very first um, blockchain Bitcoin related investment uh, early 2016, uh, investing in Vala. And during due diligence, uh, late 2015, we finally understood uh, what Bitcoin is and uh, what makes it special. So uh, ever since we became a huge fan, we have been investing quite a bit in, in crypto uh, investments. Iconic is one of our investments and there's uh, a bunch more. Um, Sferity, uh, Coinland in, in Mannheim. Uh, and, 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 and a few more. <clears throat> and I personally, I'm a huge fan of um, Bitcoin because I'm very much convinced that uh, a, an, an asset without counterparty uh, is an asset you should hold uh, because uh, as we see all the time that counterparty risks uh, materialize, you know, um, uh, that's are not paid and uh, uh, in publicly listed companies, there's uh, funny stuff going on. So not, not in all companies, but in a few. Uh, so the counterparty risk is, is emerging. So an asset without counterparty risk uh, uh, is something you should have, um, like gold. And I think Bitcoin is superior to gold. And that makes me very bullish on Bitcoin. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, who's next? Maybe, maybe Dirk, would you like to present yourself or your company? Yes, uh, thank you, Philip. So I'm uh, Dirk uh, Sturz. I'm CEO of Börse Stuttgart District Exchange. What do we do? We build up the first trading venue for cryptocurrencies uh, and uh, went live end of last year. So the first trading venue in Germany. Um, uh, who's the key market that we're addressing? First of all, obviously retail investors and retail investors who firstly are um, highly cost sensitive, who uh, at the same time want to trade in a trusted environment and um, who are sophisticated traders. So you need to know what's the difference between um, a limit orders and market orders. So this is the target audience of uh, BSDX. Um, at the same time, we are addressing uh, institutional investors and we're talking to a lot of banks who are now starting their processes to analyze uh, entering the crypto markets. So we see a lot of movement going on here mm -hmm. on the institutional side. Why is this important um, to me? And uh, do I believe that it's a good idea to invest in Bitcoin? Um, I would give a very simple answer to this, uh, um, but at the same time, I would say it's the most sophisticated answer that you can give. And uh, um, I've been a lot in uh, financial markets research and actually there's only, or the, the, the most proven thing in financial markets is that you can significantly increase your uh, risk return ratio just by simply naively diversifying. So my answer, if you ask me, is it a good idea to invest into Bitcoin is yes. And if you ask me why, then I would say simply because it's there. We can, obviously you can put more <clears throat> education into it, but this is the most scientific answer that at least I can give to the question. So it yes, very clear there. answer. Yeah, <laughs> it was a very clear answer. Okay, <laughs> uh, maybe Patrick, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. So I'm Pat. I'm the CEO and managing partner of Iconic. Uh, we are a Frankfurt headquartered uh, crypto asset management group. We also have offices in um, 
New York, London, and we actually just opened in Singapore back in February. Uh, we focus on two specific areas. We actually began as Iconic Lab, a uh, crypto and blockchain focused venture capital group seeding early stage blockchain and crypto companies. However, uh, some of our larger uh, investors wanted exposure to blue chip crypto assets, so Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a handful of others. So we launched a crypto asset index fund group, and one of our subsidiaries towards the end of last year actually became Europe's very first fully licensed crypto asset index fund manager. Uh, leveraging this and leveraging other uh, networks and infrastructure that we have, we're actually working on a series of interesting investment vehicles, which we're hoping to unveil in the coming months. Um, so we're very excited. Everything we do is around driving uh, Bitcoin and crypto adoption as a whole. Uh, I am very much a big proponent of Bitcoin, similar to Dirk. Uh, my alignment around this is that if you look back historically, Bitcoin has a very profound impact on the sharp ratio of any passively managed or actively managed portfolio, even with just a one, three or five percent allocation to it. Uh, it is necessary to have an allocation of crypto in your portfolio if you are any investor ranging from retail. Uh, retail all the way up to the largest levels of institutions. However, uh, what has become predominantly clear over the last couple of months is that there still is a significant lacking of infrastructure in the crypto asset space that will drive institutional adoption. And I really hope that we're able to touch on some of those talking points uh, and have a discussion around what still is needed to drive adoption for institutions later in this conversation. Excellent. Great. Um, who's next? Finally, we have Christian Lavit here. You also want to present yourself quickly? Yeah, sure. So, good morning. I'm Christian, um, Managing Director from Block Size Capital. And what we're doing is exactly providing the infrastructure that we feel is currently lacking on that market, um, which is a smart order routing algorithm. Um, we're connecting um, exchanges where you can trade cryptocurrencies later on and also digital assets and institutional traders. So this works through um, our software, which is called Block Size Core, um, and that connects um, those two parties. Um, our order uh, routing algorithm um, checks liquidity on existing exchanges, pricing, and then it allows you, if you want to place a 1000 BTC order, for example, to slice that order into different pieces and split it across different exchanges, because the last thing you want is to cause a flash crash when liquidity is currently not available on the market. And, and our software checks that before executing orders. Also, we're providing market data, which are tradable. Uh, this is, I think, very important. Um, and we're providing the solution um, for banks and financial institutions also to facilitate the post-trade settlement process. It's one thing to trade OTC and manually settle a trade. It's a completely different other thing to have a very high STP, straight through processing rate, and fully automatically execute the trade and then settle it. And this is exactly the solution that we provide. Our clients are um, B2B. Um, it's very interesting um, what's currently happening because we receive a lot of inquiries from banks that want to get into that space, uh, meaning offer for their retail clients or institutional clients um, services related to mainly Bitcoin, um, but Ether also and a, a few other um, cryptocurrencies. Um, but I think even more interestingly, it's banks already being familiar and in that business for a couple of months or years that go through existing brokers and that now have the appetite to internalize the margin that they're paying to brokers, which is possible through our solution. Yeah, sounds excellent. Uh, very interesting. Uh, so let's directly start with the first uh, question. I think Patrick uh, posed the question to himself already. So the question would be, uh, what infrastructure do we already have? Uh, such that institutionals can invest and what parts of the infrastructure are missing? I think that's a formidable first question, right? Patrick, you want to start? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, well, so I think there's multiple layers that are missing. And if you look at it, we have to look at how, how do institutions get involved with crypto assets? How do they get involved with Bitcoin? Uh, there's, of course, the opportunity to directly invest. There's opportunities to invest into funds. There's opportunities to invest into uh, certificates. And hopefully in the near future, there's opportunities to invest into uh, regulated market exchange traded products. Uh, basically, as a crypto asset manager, the holy grail is to get the uh, Bitcoin ETF, right? But before we get to there, I think there's a longer conversation that we have to have around the infrastructure of crypto itself. So we can touch on maybe those other points a little bit later. 
And what has become abundantly clear is that the infrastructural rails of crypto them itself cannot support the heavy volume of institutional investment. For instance, one of the biggest misnomers or misconceptions in crypto is that uh, hedge funds or venture capitalists and these other, frankly, micro cap hundred million dollar funds are institutional investors themselves. And frankly, nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, institutional investors are billion dollar family offices, large endowments, large pension funds. And frankly, these are groups that typically only invest maybe 50, $100 million minimum in any particular deal. And if we look at the market cap of crypto itself, it's anywhere ranging between 150 to 200 billion over the last uh, about year or so. This is, to be honest, uh, an achievement for sure, but so micro compared to the overall structures that these uh, institutional groups are used to investing in, that if they were to enter this market, they would end up causing a significant amount of slippage on their investment, which is part of partly one of the reasons why they are avoiding this. Further, if you look at what happens in crypto when large volumes like this inevitably come in or exit the market, all we have to do is look at what happens on March 12th of this year. It's the absolute perfect example where we saw significant slippage on exchanges where even the buys and the sells on various order books were over 5% in their spread, which is absolutely insane. And this is just because of mass liquidations from uh, small hedge funds, from some mining groups, as well as mass liquidate uh, liquidations of over leverage on some derivatives exchanges. Basically, during this period of time, the exchanges weren't able to facilitate a liquid market. And on top of that, most OTC desks literally just turned off. So in a time of their absolute most need for their clients, you weren't able to actually place any buys or sell orders with the largest traders in the marketplace and market makers turned off all their software as well. Further, uh, you had the blockchain networks themselves not be able to settle any of the trades that were being processed during this period of time just because of the lack of scalability of the assets themselves. So people were waiting hours upon hours for their uh, trade settlement to come through so they'd be able to rehedge their positions, and it didn't happen. And this was even such a profound impact on that one particular day that there is a, a rather noteworthy crypto hedge fund that was managing about 20, $25 million worth that because they weren't able to execute their trades, at least by their claim, they had to completely shut down and they've now liquidated their fund entirely with a very minimal amount uh, because the infrastructural rails of crypto are not yet ready for institutional adoption. Okay, who wants to add something? Uh, uh, Christian, um, what did you experience, uh, especially during these, uh, yeah, let's call it crash times uh, in mid-March? Hmm. So uh, we, we had this discussion quite often. Why is the current market lacking liquidity? What is preventing investors from entering it? And it's some sort of hen and egg. Um, so arguing that, that the volume or the market cap is not high enough for institutional investors, that, that's kind of difficult. Um, you have to further dig down and see what's preventing them. And, and what Pat says is, is completely right. I mean, um, scalability is a problem, settling transaction on chain, certainly, although you could theoretically clear that transaction before that, it depends on how you trade um, with your counterparty, but it is a problem. Um, and also it feels a little bit like 1998, if we want to compare it to the early stages of the internet. Infrastructure is existing. Um, um, but not interoperable inter yet on, and, and yet not still fully being integrated in the market. But um, we're seeing great progress in terms of um, secure custody solutions that are coming up. I mean, Blocknox is one example. Um, you've got Metaco, Securisys, Finoa, a lot of custodians already providing that services. But of course, adoption takes time. I mean, those systems, they're not implemented overnight. And it's only one a very tiny single piece of the entire chain. So once you've got custody, you have to answer the question, where do you get my market prices from? Uh, from? I mean, positions that easy, I can get that as custodian, but market prices. And then once I have those assets in my custody account, where do I trade? How does that work? Do I have to actually phone my OTC broker and then transmit the order via phone? 
uh, no, that, that's not what I'm used to as institutional investor. I want to trade through my user interface as asset manager directly with that broker, but still there are only a limited number of brokers. And then once you start using those brokers, you come to the conclusion that, oh, that's fine, but how does, it, how does the settlement process work with my custodian? It's completely manual. And then this is clearly the problem that we have, that we now have to connect those different bits and pieces, create interoperability of them, increase the STP rate, because um, I mean, a lot of work is still done manually and despite um, the low uh, throughput of existing blockchains and, and DLT platforms, we're also limited in terms of capacity because the processes are still, uh, I mean, related to a lot of manual work and, and this will happen. It just takes time. We have to connect the different dots and pieces um, and it will happen quickly. That's also um, what we're currently seeing. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, I, I completely, I completely exactly. agree to, uh, uh, to what you guys said, but I just want to add one point, and I think that this is a problem that is not limited to, uh, uh, to crypto, because uh, when we look back into the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, we had the most liquid uh, assets with asset-backed commercial papers, and this market completely dried out like overnight. So this can happen actually in any asset class, and this is not specific for crypto from, from my point of view. How do we deal with this as, uh, as a trading venue? Um, uh, actually, we are simply learning from what we have seen in other markets and adopting it to crypto. So, so what we have at BSDEX is that we do have circuit breakers. So when we have uh, fast markets, then we simply uh, um, go into an auction that everybody has a chance to enter the orders, to change the orders, to cancel an order. And this is how we take a little bit speed out of the market when we have these fast markets to uh, just ensure uh, price, price quality. This is actually an interesting conversation. I was talking with some of the larger uh, and prominent crypto exchanges about this uh, a week or two ago. And someone asked the question, should there be a circuit breaker on crypto? Um, should we shut the exchanges off? Should we allow the OTC to ask the opportunity to regroup? Should we allow the market makers to remake their books and then have that short period of time where then we can reopen trading facilities and allow people to kind of collectively cool their heads and then reapproach the marketplaces? Um, that kind of bastardizes the spirit of crypto to a certain extent, though, if you bring in this circuit breaker, because now you have unilateral parties that are determining the market fluidity itself. And that kind of it goes against the spirit of crypto that is decentralization. Um, so some exchanges were obviously proponents of this, those that act in a, more of a purely regulated sense because they understand the necessity. But you're never going to be able to shut off Bitcoin itself. It's just impossible. You can't do it. So you are completely disenfranchising your own investors if you implement that circuit breaker because they will not be able to move their Bitcoin within that certain pool, uh, which actually creates a severe competitive disadvantage uh, for people engaging with that exchange. Yeah, good point. But let's let's move a little bit broader. So um, uh, it has been indicated previously. Is in your mind the interest of institutional investors increasing, and what types of institutional investors? You know, it's it's probably not the large scale pension funds. It's more like minor family offices. It has been mentioned in the uh, introductions uh, here and there, uh, but maybe you could also answer uh, on this question. You know, what institutionals do we now see moving in this space or at least becoming interested? Who wants to start with? Maybe Dirk or Alexander, please, yes. I think we, we, I think yesterday or two days ago, we saw a huge landmark decision uh, in Wyoming because Wyoming yeah. allowed to, for, for um, uh, insurance companies to invest uh, in, in crypto. So they changed the regulation. So what we see is, we talked a lot about uh, the technical infrastructure. But what, we, what we're seeing is also the regulatory side is opening up, making it possible to, um, to in, invest in, uh, for, for institutions to invest in, in, in Bitcoin and crypto. And I, I think alongside, I think what we see is that institutions are learning. So they're learning, uh, you know, the sharp ratio is improving, they're learning the risk is, is there in the short term. So there's strong um, fluctuations in the short term, but uh, if, if you expand the time frame to, even a few weeks or a few months or have a, an, a, an, an annual perspective, then the risk is fairly low. Because if you, if you look at the low, uh, the Bitcoin low prices mm -hmm. uh, for every calendar year, then uh, the risk is much, much uh, lower because, you know, as we all know, March 12 comes and, and, and very quickly goes. So institutions are learning. They, they see the technical infrastructure. They see the regulatory changes. So I think the whole, the whole, um, 
trend um, is, 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 is steady and, and, and moving towards opening up uh, for institutional investment. Yeah, who, uh, Dirk, would you agree on this? Uh, what, talk, what talks are you having day by day with maybe institutional investors such as small banks? Oh, Dirk is frozen. Then maybe. Yeah, it looks like Dirk's frozen. Um, uh, so I could speak to this. So we're having lots of conversations with, of course, uh, family offices. They've always kind of had a, a tepid view on crypto. It was always a optimistic curiosity, if you will, uh, because at the end of the day, family offices, they try to hold a significant amount of their portfolio in cash or liquid assets, because of course you have to continue financing the family and their uh, daily lives itself. Um, so Bitcoin offers the opportunity to have a kind of inflation adjusted uh, cash liquid position relative to fiat currency, right? So family offices have always been involved with this. Very large and prominent ones are entering the space. Uh, but what's interesting is hedge funds have and have always been here. Uh, those aren't going to be going anywhere. And even larger hedge fund groups are now entering. Uh, but even pensions and endowments are now starting to become players in the crypto space. And in particular, in the United States. Uh, in Europe, you have a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, Europeans just as a whole are technically uh, a little bit more risk averse, I would say, than the gun-toting Americans are at the end of the day. So I think you're going to start to see more institutional adoption there. Uh, for instance, it was well publicized towards uh, the middle of last year how uh, two uh, fully public U.S. pension uh, state managed funds in Virginia had deployed capital to Morgan Creek, a uh, digital VC. So you're starting to see these uh, certain instances change. And what was actually very interesting to see is how Grayscale, uh, the most prominent crypto asset manager in the world, they manage the Grayscale trusts uh, for Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum. They had in Q1 this year, their absolutely highest inflow of uh, assets under management to their platform. I think it was something like $350 million. And at least by their story, uh, predominantly most of this was from institutional investors. It was from endowments and pensions and hedge funds. So the interest is there. It's very small compared to what the whole institutional space is. And we're still a little bit away from seeing a CalPERS, for instance, enter. But I think we're starting to get a little bit more incrementally there as new products and new managers are starting to come to the space. Okay, interesting point. Dirk, would you like to add something on the question? What kind of institutional investors are interested? You know, which profile they have? We lost uh, Dirk for a second, but now he should be back. Yeah. yeah. So um, the uh, uh, institution or, or the type of institutional investors that we are um, uh, talking to have uh, retail flow uh, behind and uh, they have retail investors who uh, want to enter the market. We did surveys from BSX uh, that, uh, uh, and, and we found out that many people answered uh, uh, or let's say start with like this. Those people who never invested in Bitcoin, a significant pr proportion of these people said, I would invest into Bitcoin if I could do it via my current bank, but I don't want to go to another entity. So uh, this is actually uh, the type of institutional investors that we are talking to. That is say, we feel the need of our retail investors. We don't want to lose them mm -hmm. to, uh, to other providers. So we need to offer them uh, 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 the opportunity to invest into crypto. Okay, perfect. Let's do a short experiment. Uh, we did this last time. It worked very well. Uh, we uh, used this Menti software and uh, you, everybody here in the call, uh, like 153 people, please now uh, go here and type in the question which is uh, coming there. It's a question about where Bitcoin, in your opinion, will stand at Christmas this year. So in about half a year, a little bit more. Where will Bitcoin uh, be then? And I'm very curious myself uh, what's coming out here. So let's see what happens. Hopefully Santa drops Satoshi's wallet under my Christmas tree. That would be nice. <laughs> but then you would, but you would not stop working, right? No, no, I put it all into uh, various products. So I did, a, I, did, I did a last year, I did a Bitcoin 10,000 party. And in order to attend, you had to send me 99 Satoshis uh, to my tip in me account. And with the 99 Satoshis, you had to give a price prediction for the end of 2021. And the median was 100,000. So uh, one year later. So 
I can show it. Yeah, so you see what's happening here. We, we, didn't, we do not see the 100,000, but we see uh, a range between mostly, yeah, three, 4,000. Yeah, 15, 20. Well, so is the larger the number mean the more votes it had for it? Yeah, exactly, exactly, okay. yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's it's not easy because of course some people add the euro sign and the US dollar sign. That's difficult to to exclude. But I think the message is pretty clear. It should. We are right now at I think seven thousand US dollar and people well, would enter here probably also US dollar. So they you could expect here it should stay as it is or it should triple uh, up until Christmas uh, somewhere in between there. Yeah, that's the experts estimate. So that's uh, quite. Varying. Okay, thanks. Uh, interesting to see. So, um, yeah, let's go on with uh, some further questions. Uh, actually, why should institutional investors uh, invest? Um, some of you guys have already mentioned this very uh, quickly, um, but please add more details here. Um, for example, imp uh, improving the portfolio metrics. Is, uh, you can also refer to the uh, central bank's policy, which are currently happening. What kind of effect might this mm -hmm. have on scarce assets such as Bitcoin? Maybe Alex directly starts, yes. I, I, I think we'll be, uh, one argument against Bitcoin is always, it's a very risky asset. It's, it's accrued, very young, 10, 11 years old, and it changes a lot. So, so that might be true. And I think with every day, this risk is going down. With every day, uh, that it doesn't crash and go away, it stays, the risk of crashing is, is slowly going down. And on the other side, <clears throat> what we see is the risk in the financial system going up with every day. So with the whole money printing uh, inflationary orgy that we are having worldwide, federal banks uh, aggressively printing money, huge government uh, deficits, the risks in the financial system, the traditional financial system is going up and, and the risk are, you know, from, from inflation, uh, financial repression, to uh, maybe new taxes that, that could be introduced to in the end pay for the, the uh, COVID crisis. Uh, so, so I think from a, a risk, uh, from a risk, purely risk perspective, I think with every day it's changing in the favor of, uh, of, of Bitcoin, especially uh, the, 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 the aspect of trust and counterparty. So in the end, we know that the, the banks could fail. Uh, the, 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 in Germany, after the war, there was uh, 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 the, the, the buildings that didn't get destroyed. Um, they, they got a new loan attached to it. So, so I think um, from a risk perspective, what could happen with the traditional financial assets, they could be more or less taken away, uh, slowly through inflation or more aggressively through aggressive taxes. And I think uh, if you look at Bitcoin, but no counterparty risk that you can store on a uh, uh, hardware wallet, uh, you can you can mitigate that risk. And, and I think uh, it's a must to, to invest. The, the, the big question is how much? Is it half 0.5 percent? Is it 1 percent? Is it 10 percent of the assets? That depends a little bit on on the on on uh, on, on the on the personal perspective of the investor. Mm -hmm. But I think it, 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 it's a pure must to invest. It's quite, quite progressive, uh, progressive, but uh, of course <laughs> you all would agree. Anybody wants to add something here? Otherwise, I have two very, very interesting questions coming out from the audience via this uh, chat group. One question would be um, that is it not a systematic uh, question of demographics and um, generations that institutional investors do not invest because that's basically people say 50 plus 60 plus who have not grown up with digital assets who are not digital natives by definition uh, they have grown up with uh, role models such as warren buffett cash flow analysis uh, traditional valuation models and so on so for them this is so new that they are very skeptical and therefore might not invest uh, what would you what would be your take on this you know is this true is this a systematic issue uh, not whatsoever. Um, if you look at how commodities are traditionally valued using the stock to flow ratio and uh, commodities like gold and silver, these are some of the most pronounced asset classes in the world. There actually is very basic financial metrics that you can use to assign price points to Bitcoin on various scales, whether they be logarithmic, uh, whether it be on the stock to flow ratio, whether it be on other things. Um, and then further, if you look at how you could price some of the other uh, DAP uh, protocol layers. So for instance, Ethereum and EOS. 
what has become very prominent, uh, particularly in Silicon Valley in the VC yeah. space, is measuring the enterprise value of a startup based on certain KPIs, key performance indicators. And a lot of those are particularly tied to users. Uh, basically, you assign a price, a price point for additional revenue that can be earned based on user acquisition and how many are engaging with that platform. And this has now become something that is very much uh, used by Wall Street banks, by institutional investors and family offices when they look at direct investments, not necessarily fund to fund investments, but direct investments into large scale uh, portfolio companies, especially when they're doing IPOs. Um, obviously, there were some issues with this because like all we have to do is look at WeWork as a perfect example as how KPIs can be not indicative of the value of a company, but you can use those exact metrics, uh, stock to flow, looking at Bitcoin, and KPI indicators, uh, looking at EOS, Ethereum, uh, and other various protocols uh, based on what the expected usage of gas will be based on user acquisition of these decentralized applications. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but you know, my personal opinion would be that there is some kind of systematic uh, problem because the knowledge about what exactly Bitcoin is, you know, you mentioned the stock to flow model, this knowledge has not been widespread at, at all. People still think that's nothing, that's a tulip bubble and so on. Yeah, yeah who else uh, uh, wants to comment on this? Maybe, maybe Christian, what's your experience about uh, the diffusion of knowledge, what Bitcoin exactly is? Yeah. No, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree either. So, um, I mean, because it's their job to also, I mean, look into new asset classes, they're in general very interested in, in understanding what it is, um, in particular from a diversification perspective. Um, something that might be a problem is that a lot of people keep criticizing Bitcoin and the accessibility without ever, ever um, even without ever having tried to buy one of those Bitcoins. They, they've never experienced how it works and how simple it can be. Um, and I think this is, this is more a problem. Um, but in general, I, I, I do disagree. I don't see that. Well, okay. I can add, but, uh, but I have to, uh, to say that there is uh, a huge uh, self-selection because institutional investors that we are talking to, they obviously they are, they are interested in talking to us. So there's uh, definitely a huge amount of institutional investors that would never talk to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to players like us in the market because they don't believe in, uh, in crypto. But uh, we do see a significant number of banks who are interested, who are willing to enter the space. And I have the feeling that they are very, very pragmatic in approaching uh, um, uh, uh, these topics that they, like, like, uh, like, like Pat said, that they simply say, hey, um, we already know how we can, how we, uh, uh, how we can, um, uh, uh, how, we, how we need to deal risk controlling wise with different types of assets. Mm -hmm. We know how we, uh, how we can incorporate uh, um, historical volatility, the current price, whatever. So they're adopting simply what they know from other asset classes to Bitcoin. And this brings you very, very far. The same holds for AML, for instance. So some people say, so yeah. how can we deal with AML and crypto? Which is the simplest question is, how do you deal with cash? And just apply that to crypto. And uh, there are a lot of banks who are very uh, pragmatic <clears throat> in these questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Uh, we are, we so far just talked about Bitcoin. That's another question coming from the chat group here. Um, of course, that's right. Uh, what about other crypto assets? You know, of course, uh, Ethereum, and then there are like all these tons of uh, altcoins out there. Um, what are institutional investors interested in? Is it just Bitcoin as we so far talked about, or is it also all kind of other assets? Who wants to take this question? Dirk, maybe you? To, to us currently, it's mainly Bitcoin. Yeah. And um, also when we are, uh, when we're talking to, to retail investors, um, so uh, when, you, uh, when you are um, um, at a fair and uh, uh, you have this banner with crypto trading, then people say, hey, what is this? And when you have a banner with, uh, hey, uh, do you want to buy Bitcoin? Then uh, all the people are queuing up and want to talk to you. So uh, right up to now, the um, crypto market is still pretty much driven by Bitcoin. This is at least what I'm experiencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's certainly being driven by. Oh, go ahead, Alex. Well, one, one important aspect is that, that Bitcoin and other crypto assets are fundamentally very, very different. So, so other um, crypto assets uh, could be mostly are inflationary, uh, controlled by a central unit, and are not as trustless as, as Bitcoin is. And that driven the value of other assets, uh, at least the local value, should be driven by the utility, by the usage of, of, of the token of the coin, 
And it's a little bit different. The value proposition of Bitcoin is a bit different. So I think they are fundamentally uh, far apart. It might make sense to look at other uh, other uh, coins, other crypto assets, if you believe that their, their usage, their utility uh, will increase over time, uh, and, and then it might be a good investment thesis. And it's much closer to traditional stocks uh, if they if stocks generate cash flow, if, if other coins generate uh, utility to, to the usage. Uh, but I think it's a very fundamental different investment thesis. Yeah, Bitcoin is for sure the gold standard. And unfortunately, people are still currently grouping uh, various cryptocurrencies, utility tokens, and even security tokens all underneath the same basket of crypto assets. And the reality is, is that every single one of these assets has a very different and unique value driver. Um, I mean, not, not touching on the scams, I'm only looking at maybe 1% of crypto assets as a whole. Uh, but if we look at those that actually do have value, um, they each have different metrics that you should be using to evaluate them by, and they each have a different use case. Uh, Bitcoins began as the peer-to-peer -peer payment system, and that uniquely pivoted over to this uh, digital gold, this store of value, this uh, deflationary asset over time. Um, Ethereum is a DAP layer. Uh, EOS is a more centralized DAP layer. Uh, various other coins like Monero are used purely for uh, completely anonymous uh, transacting, right? So there's a whole bunch of different layers that you have to consider here. And one thing that we've come to find is that Bitcoin is, of course, the gold standard. That's what everybody and every institution currently does look at because it is, of course, the most well known and it's the most tangible to value. Um, there's something more real about Bitcoin from a perspective uh, standpoint than other crypto assets right now. And that's because dApps have yet to be built on top of it. Uh, but some interesting things have come up from our side. So we've actually had investors ask us, well, when are you going to launch an exchange token uh, index fund? Uh, because these are actually very uh, prominently performing assets because the utility of a lot of these exchange tokens has effectively been proven uh, by Binance, by Huobi, by OKX, et cetera. Now, you do run into the issue that these coins are uh, issued by centralized entities. So these are not purely decentralized like Bitcoin itself is. But what we always try to tell everybody is you can't just look at these assets as um, a singular funnel, but rather you have to divide them into various silos uh, and evaluate them thusly based on what unique metrics they have behind them as its own value driver. Okay, uh, interesting point, definitely. We have another question um, concerning the upcoming halfening uh, reward, uh, which should happen now in May. Do you all think that uh, the effect here, which is basically a shortening supply, by maybe stable demand, let's see, uh, that this is uh, leading to an increasing price or because we already know this now since a couple of months, such that uh, this is already priced in and the result would be that nothing happens. What's or the price decreases actually, you know, who, who would like to take an opinion on this? <laughs> I think what, what Patrick just earlier mentioned in, in context, I think there will be an adjustment period over a few weeks or months mm -hmm. uh, where not much happens. But uh, uh, so far, the, you know, by the Twitter user, user 100 trillion, the, the stock to flow model uh, seems to be valid. And, and the stock to flow model uh, tells us that uh, with each having um, the value of Bitcoin will increase by, a, uh, uh, by another magnitude of 10. So, so I, I do believe uh, as long as the stock to flow model all holds, which, uh, which so far it does, that we will have a very significant price increase connected to the having, and it's connected to yes, the supply is decreasing, but also it's connected to the network effects that are continuously increasing on the demand side, which then will lead to a, a adjustment over the next uh, one one and a half years towards the range of fifty to one hundred thousand uh, after after the having. So, so I do agree in uh, like in the, in the eight weeks after having probably nothing happened. Yeah, so Alex, because there has been another question here in the chat, you would trust and believe into the uh, stock to flow model, right? Yeah, so, so far it holds. I, I think that the code integration uh, at this point is valid. It might break in the future to the to the upside and to the downside, by the way, to, in both directions. Uh, and and then maybe if it if it holds, then the the risk adjustment will be in a way that it will be discounted from 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 the future. So so it will it will rather break to the upside. <clears throat> but uh, so far, statistically, and I'm not a ma mathematician, but I try to uh, understand it as much as possible, so far it holds. 
Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the logarithmic I'm, I'm, scale of uh, Bitcoin and you do a logarithmic model of stock to flow ratio versus uh, its price, you very clearly see a lockstep approach um, on its logarithmic scaling of overall value based on uh, the halvings occurring over a historical period of time. Typically, that effect starts taking place three to six months after uh, the halvening occurs. So I don't expect any movement towards later this year. But we can very definitively point to real world examples as to why uh, the halving is not currently priced in. Uh, and this is what people have to understand. You cannot look at Bitcoin the same way as you look at the uh, stock value of a company where, yes, all things being equal in Keynesian economics, if you look at uh, the valuation of uh, the Deutsche Bank shares, yes, new information should theoretically move that price. And if that information is already known, then theoretically it doesn't actually have any uh, impact outside of pure speculation uh, by traders on the marketplace. But if you look at commodities, um, we are continually mining oil, we're continually mining gold, we're continually mining uh, silver, so much so that we even have significant amounts, and I'll use oil as the example here, held in reserve by OPEC. Uh, that is merely just not being uh, pushed to the marketplace. And that reserve, which can be unilaterally pushed into the market, can have wild fluctuations on the overall price of oil, even though it was known throughout the entire period by everybody that that oil reserve and the amount of oil being uh, facilitated was being uh, pushed to the marketplace or would one day be pushed. Uh, same as we know that oil is eventually going to be running out. And in periods where we go through dry spells, even though we know they're coming, the inevitable impact of oil is that its price goes up over time. So you have to take off your uh, shares and debt uh, mentality when you're looking at Bitcoin and you have to put on your commodity cap. Okay, interesting. Um, I, I, would, I, would like, I would like yeah, to add, so I, I'm personally not, not convinced by stock to flow ratio because when you, um, I think it's hard to compare to uh, commodities because uh, uh, um, uh, like, like oil because uh, they're consumed. So uh, once you uh, uh, once you use it, you need to have like like another gallon of oil, and this is a huge difference compared to uh, gold or to to crypto. Um, when you look at stocks, uh, at least um, as far as you are not assuming that uh, new stocks are issued, you have a limited amount of stocks too. And following the stock to flow ratio, the stock price of each stock corporation then should be endlessly high. And this is not what's happening. This is not what what, what you're observing. Concerning the halving, I think, yes, there is definitely uh, um, an impact on the uh, uh, um, uh, an influence on the Bitcoin price. But at the same time, there are tons of other effects that we're seeing. And when you, um, especially when you're looking at Corona crisis right now with the shutdown of uh, large parts of the industry, energy prices are as low as they've ever been in the history of Bitcoin. So these are all effects that play into the uh, Bitcoin price. And you have, if you ask me uh, what's the, uh, the, the best guess where Bitcoin price should be by the end of the year, I, I, I believe in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, capital markets efficiency, or at least I believe that financial markets are smarter than I am. So my guess would always be, I look at the current st uh, stock price at cost of carry until the end of the year, which is currently zero because we don't need to pay uh, interest rate. So I would say the current, stock, uh, the, the current uh, uh, price of Bitcoin is the best guess for uh, for Bitcoin price end of the year. Uh, see, I would, as a counterpoint to that, I would say every Bitcoin hodled is a Bitcoin consumed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm wallet trademarking lost. that. <laughs> at, at every paper wallet that, that's lost. Exactly. <laughs> I think the closest analogy should not be oil or stocks, it should be gold. So yes. uh, I think the stock to flow model with gold clearly indicates that uh, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin stock to flow model is still on a path that's, that's valid, that's, that's, that's okay. And, um, and uh, you know, gold has been criticized uh, for 5,000 years as a, 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 a pet rock, <laughs> a, a pet rock. And, and the return over the last 15, 20, 30 years has been 8% in Germany tax-free. And, and, and the properties of Bitcoin are very, very close and it's much more liquid, it's much more transferable. <laughs> Gold is hard to carry and, and Bitcoin is not. So I think the properties are, in my mind, most, most properties are superior. One property is not, which is, um, it's not as established as gold because it's only 11 years old and gold is 5,000 years old. 
And I think if you look at gold, uh, if you apply the value of gold to the value of Bitcoin, we arrive at half a million dollars per Bitcoin. That's not something that's going to be uh, achieved in the short term, but I think that's the trajectory that we can see. And I think the stock to flow model will break at some point. And I think if it breaks, it breaks rather to the upside. Interesting point, uh, but it's uh, absolutely speculative, of course, you know, the future will tell. We have a last question, um, which is basically the following. What is the typical time horizon of institutional uh, investors if they are investing in Bitcoin and crypto assets? So is it a short term play for speculation, for example, or are uh, institutional investors holding these assets longer, say, on the horizon for five years or even longer? Um, that would be the last question for today. So therefore, who, what, who would like to take this? I would say depends, and the the, the, yeah. the time range is between one nanosecond and ten years. So, uh, uh, yeah, so, so it completely depends on the strategy that uh, the uh, uh, that the uh, institutional investor is following. I would certainly say that we're starting to see a lot of institutions become more interested in passive uh, investment, that they definitely want to have a long-term exposure, uh, particularly to Bitcoin, because we're starting to see its uh, the stock-to-flow ratio and its value uh, it be derived, and they're starting to understand this narrative. It's something that people in crypto have known for uh, three to nine years, but they're only just now starting to understand what that really means on an institutional level. However, historically, I would say that it's predominantly been uh, very short time horizons. Uh, these are mostly hedge funds that are trading Bitcoin. Uh, they're taking significant leverage positions in Bitcoin and other uh, very liquid crypto assets, Ether being a good example as well. Um, and basically, they're just trading these assets and moving in and out of these positions, either on a monthly, weekly, or daily, or even exactly, uh, as was already said here, on a uh, very, very minute scale based on the trading strategy itself. Um, High frequency trading doesn't work in crypto as well as it does in traditional markets, but there are some groups out there that are working on trying to accomplish that. Perfect. I think that was a very nice closing. I hand now back over to uh, Jan for some uh, closing uh, remarks.